the Zoom meeting to uh, Neve on YouTube, then we can start. Yeah, I think it's nice. So we can start today's uh, meeting. Zoom meeting to uh, Neve. Okay. So good evening or good morning, everyone. This is Xue Jin Li from Zhejiang University, and I am the host of today's event. Here, I'm excited to introduce today's speaker and my, uh, my colleague, Professor Ri Xiao. Dr. Xiao is a Hanzhou Talent Program Professor at Zhejiang University. He received his bachelor degree from the University of Science and, and Technology of China in 2009, and he got his PhD from the Zhang Hopkins University in 2015. Before joining the faculty at the Zhejiang University, he was an associate professor at Hohai University, China. His research interest is in the modeling of polymers and the mechanics of soft materials. He has published more than 70 papers in peer-reviewed journals. His topic today is damage of soft materials. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ray Xiao. So, Ray, it's your turn. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Xu, for inter mm -hmm. introduction. Okay, I will share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I can, oh, okay, full screen now. Okay, so uh, thank you, uh, Xue Jin, for the in, uh, introduction. So I'm I'm Rui Xiao. I'm from uh, uh, Zhejiang University, and today I'm very happy to give the uh, give a talk about the damage of soft material. So this is the work we have done in the past uh, uh, two years or three years. So um, okay, Let's see. Uh, let me uh, wait a minute. Okay. So okay. So. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is the background. So the first introduction is natural rubber. Uh, until I was growing up, I realized that rubber is actually grew on the trees. So after you get it from the trees, you do some chemical treatment, you can get the natural rubbers. The natural rubber have a property that we call uh, um, we call it the hyperelasticity. So what is hyperelasticity? The first thing is uh, is the stress strain curve is nonlinear. The second is that you do the loading and loading. The, the curves are identical. So that means there's no hysteresis. So this is hyperelasticity. So this is a very classical data from trailers experiments. So they do the uh, natural rubber. They have uh, do the test for uniaxial tension, pure shear and equal biaxial tension. So they have very beautiful curves. So in our lab, we can also synthesize material with hyperelastic properties. So we can do very simply, uh, we have a monomer, you have a cross-link. The cross-link have two double bonds so that it can form a chemically cross-link that works. So if the, if the TG gas transition temperature is uh, well, uh, well uh, below, the, uh, well above the gas transition temperature, the material is elast elastomers. So you keep it a property called hyperelastic. The, the material properties that uh, uh, is affected by the cross-link density, the higher cross-link density you have, they have a stiffer material response. And the modulus also increase. But the problem is the modulus increase, the failure strain decreases. So you can see that this one, you can, uh, people may say, okay, why not this material have a very high cross-link? The, the failure strain is not no. This is because we do the test in compression. In compression, it's probably okay, but if in, in tension, the modulus and the uh, finite strain, they have very uh, inverse relationship. If we have a modulus around several MPA, the, the strain failure is only like 20 or 30%, it's very low. So in fact, for the natural rubber or this chemical cross-link that works, uh, the, the material is very soft. So we try to improve the mechanical properties. So how can we do? The, for, the, for the lateral rubber, the most simple way to do it is using uh, fillers. 
The most commonly used fillers is carbon black. You put carbon black in the lateral rubber, it form a uh, filler rubbers. This material, the mechanical properties, the strength are modulus actually increase with the volume fraction of carbon black. So this is the very standard materials and very widely used. The most widely used is for tires. So you can imagine how many these field rubbers can be used every day. But the field rubbers have a properties called a Mooney's effect. So what does that material uh, probably say that is you loading, you unloading, you reloading. The reloading curve is actually smaller than your previous loading curve. So that means the material have a, a softening response. So we call this softening response stress softening. This, this effect is also called the Mooney's effect. So why, why the, the film rubber have the Mooney's effect? It's because there is some damage. You, you deform the material, there's some damage occurs. So that is the reason you, call, you have the, this Mooney's effect. So for the, uh, for the chemical cross-link networks, it's, so, it's also soft in, and it's brittle. So how can we improve the mechanical pro properties of the chemical cross-link networks? So there are some strategies. The most commonly known is the double network hydrogels, uh, long composite uh, gels, and the multiple network elastomers. So all these materials is they have um, they are very strong and tough. The reason for them uh, for them can sustain the Nazi deformation is because first they have a loose network of matrix. So this matrix is very loose, so that you can deform into Nazi deformation while this material not break. A lot of things is that the material have energy dissipative mechanism. So that means that they have we deform the little energy dissipated. So you you, you the energy dissipated that is the, the the stress concentration can be minimized. So that is also the reason you have very large deformations. So I will introduce a double network hard gels. I think a lot of people are very familiar with material. So this material is initially uh, proposed by Jianping uh, Gong uh, from Japan. So you have a first network. You put the first network in the solvent again, and the, uh, the chemically, and then the swelling, and then you use, use the, the synthesize the second network. So the second network is very loose. So you can see that for each network, the pure first network, pure second network, the mechanical property is not strong. But if you have a double network, the mechanical property can be significantly enhanced. So uh, for the double network, hard gels, you compress it um, to a very large strain and you unloading, the material not break. But for the each pure network, you, they are brittle. If you compress it, they just uh, have the brittle failure. Uh, now I introduce multiple network elastomers. So this is the same similar to the double network uh, hydrogels. You have the first network, you swirling, and then you synthesize the second network. The, the only difference is now is you remove the solvent. So there's no solvent inside. So it's elastomer, not a hydrogel anymore. So you can see this material and mechanical properties strongly depend on stringent ratio of the first networks. So we have the um, um, double network hydrogels, and uh, we also have the multiple network elastomer. So these two materials actually uh, inhibit the similar Mooney's effect as uh, in the um, in the field rubbers. You can see that you loading, unloading, reloading. The reloading has stress softening. So why this material also have the uh, have the Mooney's effect? So you can you can imagine. Actually, these materials are very similar to field rubbers. Let's use the uh, double network hard gel as an example. The second network uh, is actually called, we call the matrix. It's very loosely, and it takes eighty percent or ninety percent of the whole value. So it's very loosely. It's a, it's a matrix. The first network uh, takes a very small fraction, a ten percent to twenty percent. So they actually act a role as fillers. So for the multiple network elastomer, the, the similar thing. The first network is filler. All the other network is matrix. So we can call this material soft matrix composite. So they actually have the similar rule as filler rubbers. So, they, so, so that is the reason they also inhibit the Mooney's effect. 
So I'm, uh, I do mining uh, to constitute modeling. So I'm interested to modeling this is the behaviors uh, of the soft material. So I will start with uh, hyperelasticity. Uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with continuum mechanics. Uh, for continuum mechanics, we, if we do a model for half elasticity, we have actually two ways to do it. The first way is use phenomenological model. For example, the Hooke model, Mooney Rivlin model, Jane model, Octave model. So all this model is phenomenological. That means they propose this stress strain relationship based on the, the experimental observations. So the mind, the mind um, point is the stress. The, the free energy density have to depend on uh, the, the strain inference or maybe depend on the, st the principal strain in the uh, principal directions. On the other side, there is a lot of type of model called a micromechanic model. Like uh, we, we are familiar with a three chain model, a four chain model, a chain model, a four chain model. So this is a micromechanic model. So basically they, they have some micromechanical mechanism behind this model. So I will use the H-chain model as an example to show how to model hyperelasticity. So for the H-chain model, it's also called Aruda Boyce model. So the model assumes that uh, the polymer chains can be assumed to have uh, H-chains uh, in a cubic. Uh, for this H-chains, one end is the center of the cubic, the other end uh, as this H nodes. When you deform it, this H-chains have been stretched equally uh, in, the, in, in all the directions. So we have the non event statistics, so we can have the free energy density of each single chain. So this lambda is a strength ratio of each single chain. Now we have the chain model. We know the strength ratio of the, of the, of these chains that is uh, equals to the uh, I1 divided by three by square, uh, square root. Uh, then we replace this one uh, into the single chain model. So we get an edge chain model. So this is very simple uh, and very straightforward. We can then calculate the strain strain curve. So the model is, this model is very successful. The reason is because they have only two parameters. One parameter is shear modulus. And one parameter is the strength limit of the chains. Uh, those simple, they are very powerful. You can see that, so this is a chemically cross-linked networks, a uh, hyperelastic response. If you use a Lee hooking model, they fail to capture the large deformation behaviors. But uh, if you use a uh, 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 chain model, they can capture very well experimental observations. But there is also some limitations for the chain model. The first limitation is, oh, I, I just re introduced the uh, trailer's data. So if you use the edge chain model to fit the trailer data, you found that it did pretty good in the uniaxial and the pure share, but it did very badly for the biaxial testing. Specifically, it predicts a relative soft response for biaxial loading experiments. So another thing is the Aruda Boys model, edge chain model, fail to describe the Mooney Rivlin plot. I will introduce the Mooney Rivlin plot later. Uh, what is it about? So let's say uh, let's say how to improve this model. So for all these H chain models, three chain model, four chain model, uh, four chain model, all these models, uh, it actually can be characterized as a, a phantom chains model. What does that mean? So this model assumes that the chains does not interact with the, their surroundings, their environments. So they are isolated from surroundings. Of course, this is not true. All the chains have the constraint from their surroundings. So how to incorporate this constraint? This is actually a very difficult topic. You can imagine that the chains have all surrounding chains. It's very complex. These forces and this constraint is very difficult to calculate. But fortunately, there are some physics um, give a very a simple picture. And one single picture is called a tube model. You can assume that all these surrounding chains can act as a as two. This chains in the tube. So this is uh, a lot of assumptions behind the tube model, but it actually works pretty good. So we use the tube model. So the tube model says that this constraint actually depends on the diameter of this tube. And the tube that you, the tube diameter is big, 
the constraint is small. The tube diameter is small. The constraint is strong. So now we have the have the, the chains. The chains is uh, itself has a strange ratio and it have a configuration entropy changes. And also they have the surrounding changes. The surrounding and when you deformation, the surrounding changes is constrained also changes. The both can contribute to the free energy density. So now the task is you need to, we have a microscopic deformation. We want to know the microscopic deformation. So we can do this, uh, uh, this if uh, the average. So we can assume initially all the chains are evenly distributed in space in a sphere. So when you deform this sphere, the sphere go to a elliptical shape. So all these chains have a, a strength ratio and the tube also have a, an have a area change. So what we do is we do average. We calculate all these averages uh, for the strength ratio, we calculate all these area changes. So what we do is we do square and then we, uh, we do the square root. So we add all the square together and we do a square root and we do some math. Uh, it turns out it's very simple. For the average of strength ratio, it's actually uh, only a function of the first strain variant. For the average of area ratio, it's actually an average of the second strain variant. So now we can use this one to replace the strength ratio for the single chains. We can use this one to replace the area changes in the tube model. So we can got a model that have free energy density uh, as this form. So this part is actually the same as the chain model. This part is, is a, 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 a part caused by the tube constraint. So now this is a modified hyperelastic model compared with the Aruda Boyce model. We now have three parameters. We have a shear modulus, we have strength limit, uh, we also have a shear modulus entanglement part. So you have three model, three parameters. That is one parameter more than the uh, Aldo Boyce model, but now the performance is much better. So the first thing I would introduce is it can actually predict the Mooney Rivlin plot. So what is the Mooney Rivlin plot? So you have an elastomer or, or the natural rubber. You do uniaxial tension, then you uh, for the y-axis, you do the nominal stress, the actually the force, divided by the NAMT minus one over NAMT squared. So this is actually the modulus. This one is uh, one over NAMT. So when you stretch it, the initial is here, when you stretch more and more, it go to this, this trend. So that means in, in the experiments, we found the modulus with stretch, the modulus first decrease, then increase in uniaxial strength, uniaxial tension test. So this is found for a lot of, a lot of rubbers and elastomers. But for the edge chain model, you found that uh, it always predicts the modulus, it literally is flat, then sharply increase. For the new hooking model, it's, all, it's, it's always flat. It doesn't increase, it doesn't decrease. But for the entanglement part, it actually decreases with strength ratio. If the model have both the entanglement part and the cross link part, it can actually predict the first decrease in modulus and then increase in the modulus. So that is the reason I said that the, the edge chain model doesn't predict the Mooney Rivlin plot, but the modified model can actually predict Mooney Rivlin plot. So a last thing uh, is the model can predict the trailers data. So previously we said that uh, the hyperelastic model uh, doesn't capture the, the biaxial, ten, biaxial test, testing data. So we can now see that the biaxial test, testing data is, is greatly improved. We can um, you know, overcome the limitations that edge chain model predicts the soft biaxial testing. The reason is the entanglement effect is actually stronger in biaxial tension. It's weaker in axial tension. So that is the reason in biaxial test, we have a stronger response and that is the reason we can well predict the bank cell tension test. Okay, so uh, this is my the first part. I introduced a hyperelastic model. 
So now the second part, I will introduce how to develop the damage model for the field robbers. So for field robbers, uh, there's a lot of models because this is very classic materials, very, um, you know, very metro materials that have been used so oftenly. So in the past like 50 years, there's not a model that have been developed. All these models depend on different mechanism for the, for example, bond rapture, molecular slipping, field rapture, disentanglement, and double layer. All these pictures can give, you know, in, in some sense, give a, a a very well prediction of the impermanent data. In some other cases, it, it, it predicts some, some phenomena, but it fails in some other phenomena. So I will introduce uh, some, some models that are, are widely used for the uh, mechanical person, uh, mechanics people. The first uh, uh, model is called a progressive damage model. The, the, the physical picture is very simple. So uh, you have the filler, uh, you have the, uh, polymer chains, the polymer chains can attach to the fillers. So they form a lot of physically chains. So these physical chains have very broad distribution. Some chains are short, some chains are long. So when you deform it, the short chains detach first and long chains detach later. So that is the reason you have the, the beautiful Mullins rivaling, um, Mullins effect. You can use simple mechanism to predict uh, the Mullins effect. And the physical picture is simple. Another picture is called a network operation theory. So what does that mean? So this, this picture is that assumes that there is a lot of junctions uh, in, the, in the polymer chains. When you deform, these junctions can actually break. The junction break. If the junction break, these short chains actually evolve to long chains. So the short chains became to long chains. You can imagine this fixed picture, short chains became to long chains. So the total number of chains decrease. So the, the network operation theory further assumes that the, the chain segments doesn't change. So we can do that this simple picture, the modulus uh, decreases, uh, the, the stretch limit increases, but, uh, um, but the, the chain segment doesn't change. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is the problem. So this is a, a, a simple physical picture. So use this physical picture, we can incorporate this physical picture into the edge chain model. Uh, using this one, we can actually also model the morning effect. So this is very nice. But now, uh, now we can see this, this model, the edge chain model together with network operation theory. If you test this model for the biaxial test, you found it's not good at all. Uh, for the uniaxial, uh, it's, 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 it's also some discrepancy. But for the biaxial, they have a larger discrepancy here. So that tells us some mechanism is, 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 is uh, ignored. So what is the mechanism is ignored? Probably because entanglement effect. So we say we, can, we have the beautiful hyper-inest model with entanglement effect. Now we can introduce the damage uh, into the entanglement model. So this is damage of the cross-linked part. Uh, so this is the same as network operation theory. So we also have the damage for the entanglement part. So physical picture is you have deformation, deformation induced a disentanglement. So that means when you deformed, the modulus of entanglement decreases. So use this one, we can predict uh, the uniaxial test and biaxial test of the field rubbers, uh, greatly improve the performance. So also, um, because the model, you can see that the model depends on the first strain invariant and the second strain invariant. So it only depends on strain invariants. So this hyperelastic model and also this damage model can be easily in implemented into final elements. So my student uh, write, uh, spend like uh, several hours and one day, write a uh, hyper and implement into Africa. And then use this final element model, we can simulate the complex shape so this is a, a experiment, this simulation. You can see that using this, uh, uh, this final end model, we can predict the experiment observations of the uh, complex mechanical performance of the field robbers. Okay, so uh, I will further introduce uh, the anisotropic damage model for double-level hydrogels. 
So this is the model I, I explained before. So you have HT model, uh, you have a uh, stress strain relationship, you have network alteration theory. Oh, this is a very simple model. Uh, you have like a, a four par uh, three parameters and use this model, you predict the, the mechanical response for double electrical heart jaws. You can see this is uniaxial. So this is the biaxial. Um, I would like to say it's not bad. Uh, it's, it, it quantitatively, it captures all the phenomena. There's some discrepancy here, here, also here, the small strain. So you may say, oh, this is probably because entanglement effect. That is not true. Because entanglement effect is the model predicts a relative soft response. But for the double letter one hard job, you can see the model actually predicts strong, uh, a larger stress response. If you incorporate the entanglement effect, they will not improve the result at all. So that means entanglement effect in double letter one hard job is not important. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the, the model still predicts my trend. The issue is this experiments. So for this experiment, if you have a, a test, a do unit extension, you do a stretch in X direction, then you unload it. Then you do a test. You cut two pieces off. One is the, in, in the X direction, one in the Y direction. And for this two piece, you do the unit extension game. Now let's imagine whether the response will be the, the same or not. The answer is not the same. For the y direction, this one, the stress is bigger. For the x direction, the stress is smaller. That means for the y direction, the initial damage is smaller. So that is have a large stress response. For the x direction, the initial damage is large. So this is, uh, is actually in, in agreement with our common sense. Because you know in the x direction, the x direction have a large damage. The y direction have a smaller damage. But the previous model, the F chain model with the network alteration theory, this is an isotropic damage model. That means <laughs> if you use this model, the two curves are the same. So this is quantitatively not correct. So that means you have to develop an anisotropic model to capture this phenomenon. So we do this one. We do uh, develop a microsphere anisotropic damage model. So for this model, so it assumes that all the chains are initially evenly distributed on the sphere. So when you deform it, all the chains are deformed differently. Some chains deform more, so they have more damage. Some chains deform less, so they have less damage. So that is the reason why you have an anisotropic response. So this is free energy density. We have um, a four chain model. We can do a uh, integration. For the integration, we actually can do the numerical one. We can discretize it and we have this model. So now the problem is you have all the chains, in all the directions. When you apply deformation, that is actually only one micro deformation. So how is the strength ratio in all the directions? You have to construct the micro and the micro mapping. So what we do, we, we do a lot of fine assumptions or use energy minimization. So we assume that uh, we put a critic constraint. The critic constraint says that uh, the, the micro chains, the average of the micro deformation, the average of the micro deformation actually equals to the micro deformation. So this is a, not a very strong assumption. So it's, the, the assumption is only because the average is equal to the micro deformation. So now we have the free energy density. We have the classic constraint. So we can do that, use a Lagrange multiplier method. So the thing is, this is a Lagrange multiplier method. That is uh, the free energy density to the reach of the minima based on the classic constraint. So how to do this one? And you discretize it and then you do the stationary condition. The, the minimal free energy density how to how to meet this uh, stationary, stationary conditions. So we also incorporate the damage rule in, into the model. The damage rule is the same as the network alteration series. So now 
the, 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 the remaining thing is some mass. It's not complex uh, compared with other problems, especially the fluid mechanics problems. The mass is pretty straightforward. So we can use this model. We can, can see how the model performance. So now you can see this is a uh, uniaxial test. You see biaxial testing compared with isotropic damage model. The, the prediction is, is much, much better. More importantly, so we can do some tests like this. You can do uh, uniaxial tension. You can do plan, uh, plan, plan strain, uh, not plan strain, it's pure. You can do uh, an equal. Sure you can do the unequal biaxial testing. You can do the equal biaxial testing. After this test, you can cut uh, pieces like a 90, zero degree C and a 90 degree C, and you do the test. So now you have the, this uh, um, very differently anisotropic stress response. The anisotropic damage model can well predict all this anisotropic stress response. So that is saying the model is because they have directional damage responses. That is the reason that can explain the damage de induced by the different deformations. Okay, so I will share the last part of the work. So I, I previously said that uh, for the field of rubbers, you have two mechanisms you can model the, the, the damage. The first model is network alteration theory. This junction, the junction break, the short chains involve two long chains. There is another um, picture is called progressive damage. That is, you have a short chains and long chains, and we deform the, the, the short chain just break. And uh, gradually the long chain break. So this model can model for the rubbers. So can this model model the uh, multiple lateral elastomers? The, the, this is how the model performance. So this is uh, the experimental data, and this is uh, simulation data. You can see the progressive damage model cannot capture the mechanical response for the multiple network elastomers. Especially, it cannot capture this significant increase in stress. So there's something I'm missing. So what is the missing is, uh, is the, the, free, the, 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 the progressive damaging model assumes that uh, all the chains uh, follow the uh, Lajewicz statistics. So um, this is uh, the issue. Lajewicz statistics have, um, have in singularities. It also says that it's only a very small fraction of chains contribute to stress. All the other chain doesn't contribute too much to the stress. Um, so we have to modify this single chain model. So we uh, adopt the, the, the model proposed by Nelty and Land from MIT. So they have proposed a model. So this model is assumed that you have a, a polymer chains. You can imagine the polymer chains initially like a coil. Then you, you stretch it. The coil generally became flat, uh, became straight. So if they became very straight, you further strengthen the polymer chains. Actually, the bond began to deform. So previous, previously, the, the entropy model doesn't consider the, the bond deformations. So their model incorporates bond deformations. So we also incorporate this mechanism into the, uh, the progressive damage model. So this is a single chain. So this is deformation for the bond. So how much is the bond deformation? Is we use the minimal free energy density. So the total deformation of the bond and the chain should, should have the minimum of the, of, the, of the free energy density. So we, what we do is we uh, get a, this derivative to lambda b and equal zero, we got the bond deformations. So now let's see how the uh, performance of the single chain model. You can see um, when you begin to strengthen the chains, initially the chains became straight. The bond doesn't deform, doesn't deform. When the chain reaches their stretch limit, the bond began to deform and, the, and the, the chain doesn't deform anymore. So this is the force in the, in, in the chains. So the Najivin statistic says that the force go to infinity when it reaches the stretch limit, but now it doesn't go to the infinity. So it scales with the, the the, the modulus of the bond. If the modulus of bond is, is larger, the, the force in the bond is also larger. 
So it overcomes the, the singularities. It also allows a lot of change to contribute to the stress. So for multiple network uh, elastomer, we, we do the, the following assumptions. The first assumption is there is a distribution of the chains uh, for the fillers for the first network. All these metrics are very loosely, loosely metrics, uh, loosely networks. So we do not uh, assume any contribution because they doesn't deform too much. We do not, do not uh, um, make the model too complex. But another thing you need to consider is you feel, you, you synthesize the material uh, uh, step by step. For, so for the first network, it actually became stringed. And the second network also became stringed. So you, you need to incorporate the pre stringe into the model. So we construct a, a model to so have free energy density like this. So this is free energy density for the filler, contribute the distribution of the chains. So this is the free energy density of the matrix, contribute to the second network, the third network, and the fourth network, and uh, extra all. So it seems very complex, uh, but I, I would like to say uh, the, the form is complex, but it's straightforward. So these two things, uh, it's complex, but straightforward. That is, you, you, you do step by step, it can finally reach its form, even take some time, but it's not that difficult. So we can have this free energy density and we can calculate the stress strain. So we can have bond deformation. We also can have damage criteria. So th this damage criteria means that you have a, a force. If a chain reach a certain force, the chains break. So it's the same idea. The short chains begin to break first, and long chains to break later. But now the thing is the short chain doesn't break immediately, it reaches the stretch limit. It allows the bond to deform to some extent, then the short chain begin to, begin to break. So we can see this model. Uh, we do uh, compare the, 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 the data from the literature from first network, so it's purely like elastic, second network, and third triple network and a quadruple network. We can capture all this uh, stress response. So it also captures the Mullins response, Mullins, um, the Mullins effect, uh, Mullins response. So you, you can now see this is the, the nominal stress uh, for the different chains. You can see that is a lot of chains and the, the, the nominal stress for all the chains is not small. It have contributed uh, significantly to the stress. So that is the reason you can capture like, this increase in stress with stretch why the previous model cannot do this. Okay, so I will go to uh, the last part, uh, uh, summary and outlook. So I, I, I would like to say, I introduced like uh, uh, several models, uh, hyperelastic uh, damage models uh, for the field rubber, uh, for the uh, double network hydrogels, for the multiple network elastomers. So this materials seems quite differently. But if we look closely, uh, we think, uh, think closely, they're actually similar. So we call it self-matrix composite. Uh, the microstructure is similar, so they exhibit, exhibit the similar uh, mechanical response, like a Mullins effect. For the hyperelastic model, what we do is we incorporate the entanglement effect. A lot of important features in the model only depend on strain invariance. For the damage for field rubber, we also incorporate entanglement effect. For the anisotropic damage model, uh, we use a long or fine uh, microsphere model. Uh, for the percussive damage model, what we do, the micro-contribution, what we do, we, do we, we modify the single model, a single chain model. So I would like to do some outlook. So in fact, uh, from the, this talk, you can see, I didn't talk about any viscoelastic response. I only talk, talk about uh, hyperelastic and the damage. In fact, the viscoelastic are widely exist in soft materials. And this viscoelastic stress is actually coupled with damage. So this coupling effect is very important if the materials are in the glass transition ranges. So this effect is need to be uh, incorporated in the future. Another thing is this tough, tough material, like a double, double lateral hydrogels or multiple lateral elastomers, they actually shows uh, shows a self-healing response. That means if you put a material in a stress-free stress state and put it for a long time or several hours or several days, 
the, the mechanical response can gradually recover to the original stress response. So that means they, they have a self-healing response. So we need to incorporate the competition between the damage and the self-healing into the model uh, in the future. So with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for the attention and uh, I would like to take questions. Thank you. I'll take 40 minutes, uh, this is my plan. Thank you, Ray. So thanks for giving us this great talk. So any questions? So if you have any question, just unmute yourself and ask the speaker. Okay. So, so I um, think this is a vote. Yeah. Please. Go ahead. Dr. Xia, I have a question. This is Jenny. Sure. So mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that um, for this uh, um, this kind of rubber or or this is a, a double a double network uh, material. Mm -hmm. There's some heavy uh, effect. I'm, I'm, can you just uh, explain something? Uh, what's the mechanism to generate self hanging Because usually. If you consider you have a damage, this means this uh, this chain is 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 a stretch too long and break. So uh, if you do not do any uh, chemical treatment or do some, for example, temperature uh, heat treatment, how this self healing happen? Yes. So I I, I think is um so is, you are you are right. Very good question. So fit rubbers. You know the field rubbers also have self healing. So for field rubbers, uh, if we put them in uh, temperature around 90 degrees and 100 degrees C for like um, several hours, one day, the morning fair can recover. Um, but for the for the double layer hard gels and the, for these materials, you you really do not need to increase the temperature. Just put them in the room temperature; they can self healing. So, so the, the, the reason is probably because um, uh, it's because that uh, uh, they, they, they have some like free 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 uh, free bonds there that can recover. that free bonds can uh, can can, uh, can attach. Can you can you me for like uh, one minute? I, I need to answer phone probably then do to, to like the, the, the test. Sure, sure. sure. Wait. Okay, sorry. So I'm I'm back. So okay. the reason <laughs> I need to the 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 COVID test. So I, I this COVID test, you know, in China right now is that they I'm in home, so they come to my home and do a COVID test for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I will I'll explain more. So for the double layer particles, they actually have a lot of uh, the free molecules. So these free molecules that. Uh, um, when you deform it, uh, so the, the chains can reattach to the free molecules to form a uniform network, so they can recover. Um, there's always some end user, uh, some, some molecules are a lot used during the synthesized process. Uh, some other message is like, you, in the synthesized pr process, you, you do some strategy just to intentionally to have some of these this, this free molecules inside the, the materials. So that you have very strong uh, self healing responses. O also, you have maybe you have the double uh, dynamic bonds, and dynamic bond can damage and uh, repair. So this is also uh, like a, 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 a very interesting topic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So 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 if if this is the if the the uh, a free chain inside of the hydrogel will form and bond continuously is the mechanism for self healing. Then this will generate a significant aging effect because, because if you do, do not have any damage, there's a, mm. always have new bound generated in the material. 
So that means yeah. that the material will lose some uh, elasticity property, right? It will become more and more rigid. Uh, do, do you know there's I, I, a, this kind of yeah, a, I, an aging effect for this kind of material? Uh, probably a lot. I, I, I didn't see too much. Uh, uh, at least in, in the material systems, what we in our lab, we, we didn't see too much. Um, the aging effect uh, is strong. So you are right. There's the, like uh, this chemical aging effect that you have this chains that uh, they react with the, the environment, oxygen, something like that. They just uh, uh, be detrimental to the materials. That is possible. I think it's possible. But uh, for the material systems, uh, as I know, uh, I didn't see much report on this on this hydro um, on this like a chemically aging effect uh, in these soft materials. Yeah. Okay, so, I have another I have another question okay. about the yeah. the uh, in your model actually, mm -hmm. um, when, when you consider the multiple network um, mm -hmm. material, so I. Um, I understand the cross linker between uh, the density of cross linker between the different network or play an important role to 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 generate a different um, uh, pro uh, mechanical properties. So, so in your model, actually, I do not see any parameter related to the density of cross linkers. Uh, can you explain how 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 you you consider this kind of factor in your model? Okay, let me let me see here. So, um, so for the for the uh, multiple network uh, elastomer, uh, the cross link density is this one. Is um, is uh, nj. So this is the number of the chains. So the cross link density is actually the number of the chains. They are scaled. You have a number. Uh, per, this is number of chain per per, per volume. So you have a, a, a larger a larger number of chain per volume. The the cross link is is larger. So this is also the cross link for the for the matrix. So this is a parameter for them. Um, so, but I want to uh, add a, a little more information for the multiple network elastomer. Uh, the matrix is very loosely. That means you can can probably not add any cross linkers. You just add some moleculars. You have to be very loosely. If the the matrix is uh, you have uh, like one percent cross link, it cannot. Um, Sustain a large deformation; it just break, it just break. But for the field of network, you have a cross link like five percent is fine. It's not bad. It can still um, stretch it. But uh, for the for the second network or the third network, the the cross link have to be very very low, like 05 percent, or even doesn't have cross link at all. So this takes us a while to you know to to optimize the mechanical properties in these material systems. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I see there is, there is a, a, a yeah, question. Yeah, there's a question yeah. from our yeah. audience. You get the question? Yeah. Do we have a stating FM failure criteria? Yes. So uh, for we, we only did a uh, one file for this this one. So so this is not a um, we do the failure. Not I I will not say the failure criteria because we 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 call it damage. But it does not um, fail. So that means we do not model the how this like uh, the 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 holes expand, uh, the, the 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 crack progress. We does not uh, does does not uh, simulate this progress. We all only simulate the damage. We assume that the short chains go to long chains. So uh, so so that uh, um, there is a, a detrimental a, a, a decrease in modulus. But we did not simulate the crack progress. Or do not assume it as the crack probation, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so this is very simple. So it's for the you yeah, hyper. Uh, it's very very simple. So uh, you you just need to input the strain invariant. Uh, so uh, if you Google uh, online, uh, you hyper uh, and uh, you get a document, and uh, you just follow the steps. Uh, input the free density. And then do the derivative to the, the first, the second invariant. And then you can you just modify the modulus by the damage rule. You, you can do it. Uh, if, if, if you are interested, you know, you can just send me an email. Uh, you can search my name. 
I, I can send my my you your hyper to you. That's great. It's not a, not a big not a big uh -huh. issue, but it, I think it's very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm. more question from audience. Uh, Ray, I have a question here. Yeah. So in the first part of your talk, so for the model mm. performance, you show that the models change during stretching, right? Yes. So I, I'm wondering. So, uh, for the model setup, do you need to put some uh in, um, parameter related to the mechanical property uh in the model? So what's the what uh, yeah? What's the input parameter uh for this model? Because it shows that the model was changed with stretching. No. So, so for for this model, we 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 do yeah. is that, yeah. So mm -hmm. we we actually fit in the curves. So uh, how this model performance? So you have a uniaxial tension test. So using uniaxial tension test, we can get the, all the three parameters. So uh, how to do this? The strength limit is always with the you know the how what what a strength ratio is hardly. So that is the parameter for the strength ratio. So the other parameters they compete with each other. So uh, the initial modulus, you know, like a five percent or ten percent initial modulus, is actually the, the summary of the two modulus, uh, the the Kent cross-linked and the and, and the entanglement. Um, but the entanglement, the modulus for the entanglement, um, when you when you deform it, this part, the stress actually decreases, and the other part, stress actually increase. So from this this minimum point, you can determine the ratio between the two. So that is the reason, uh, that is uh, how we get the parameters. We actually do the fitting, but, um, but the, 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 this curve explains why you need to incorporate the entanglement effect. Is, that is the reason you can see that entanglement effect actually in the unilateral tension, it decreases with, uh, uh, with, uh, with string, string ratio. That means if you deform it, initially the, the entanglement is strong, but as you mm -hmm. deform it, the entanglement became weaker and weaker. But the the chain is not the same. If you stretch a chain, initially the chain may not be that strong, but if stretch it, the chain became more stiffer and stiffer. So that is, uh, you know, the the competition between the two that gives this like non uh, non monotonic uh, curves. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so, you. Any other question? Oh, hi, Ray. This is Zhao Yan yeah. from University at Buffalo. Yeah, thank you very mm -hmm. much for the very nice talk. And uh, uh, it's yeah. very uh, fantastic work. So in fact, I do have two questions regarding your experimental part. So at okay. the end of your presentation, you do mention some kind of viscosity that you are interested to uh, study mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. So I'm just uh, curious in your experiment experimental measurement um, mm. because viscosity, both viscosity and the plasticity are related to the irreversible process, right? Yes, yes. And mm. uh, I'm just curious how you can distinguish the viscosity from the plasticity, like uh, how you uh, measure uh, the like a plastic deformation, like, uh, or I mean the irreversible, like irreversible, uh, e, e reverse the deformation uh, from uh, uh, caused by uh, viscosity or plasticity. Okay, so so uh, so for for the for the double lateral hard just it, it have a lot have these worries because um, because it have a lot of water inside the viscoelastic effect is very small, but for the multiple lateral elastomers it's it's not. Um, uh, the TG is not for some for some material system. The TG is not is not uh, very very low. It's pro probably like forty degrees C. So in that case, a room temperature is material is actually you know is in the glass transition ranges. So you have a strong um, uh, viscoelastic responses. So for these responses, what we do is we we do the you know the the change strength rate. So what we do is change strength rate. Uh, also, we do the stress relaxation test. So if we see that uh, um, we have a strong red dependence, um, but uh, when you add loading, they finally go, go back to the original shape. Uh, we, 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 even like several minutes, we still think that uh, this is like a viscoelastic response, it, it is reversible. But okay. for, on, on the other hand, if, if you deform it, you have a very large residual strain, like a 
several hundred, not several hundred, uh, several uh, like ten percent or twenty percent or thirty percent. Uh, and uh, if even you wait for like uh, days, it doesn't recover. This is probably called irreversible um, processes, like damage responses. Uh, so in, in this case, it's it's, it's more complex. Uh, I think the all the reversible process is is always simple, but in reverse process is is complex. So uh, what do we do? You 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 can just adopt this common um, test for the uh, viscoelastic elastic responses. Um, like a uh, change strength rate, a uh, user stress analyzation, and measure the dimension after unloading. So this is probably what we do in, in our lab. Yeah. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question, in fact, is about the like uh, thermal effect. So in fact, mm -hmm. my student and I recently performed some phenomenal simulation for certain types of polymer and mm -hmm. do observe some kind of crack tip, like a temperature drop in front of the uh, the, the crack tip. So so mm -hmm. although here you didn't uh, uh, perform, I mean, measure the, the crack, uh, uh, perform any kind of uh, crack propagation test, but mm -hmm. I, I'm just uh, curious if you, uh, uh, in interested in this kind of uh, like thermal uh, effects study for your uh, elastomer uh, testing? Uh, yes, so so that is something we, we, did, we didn't do. So I have a large area called a glassy polymer. So I work heavily on, on a glassy polymer, the thermal yes. plastic, uh, thermal state, and like a glassy polymer, the, the TG, the glass transition. So for these glassy polymers, I, I work heavily on this like non-equivalent behaviors and we, we do the thermal mechanical coupling. Uh, we, we use the DIC to measure the strain. Uh, we use the infrared camera to measure the temperature change. Uh, it's, it's very complex and very interesting. For, for, yeah. But for software materials, uh, we, we, right now, we, we still are uh, at the early stage. So we, we, we tackle the simple problems. We don't tackle the complex problem like the crack progression, all these things. I think. Um, after this project, um, we, 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 we will advance and we will continue. Uh, finally, we, we need to go to the FENIA. This, this is something that is very important. If we go to FENIA, all these like uh, crack propagations, all these like uh, uh, summer effect uh, will be considered and it's very important. And um, maybe next time, uh, like I, well, I do slowly, but uh, maybe maybe in three <laughs> years or four years, we can, we can have some results out. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the further information and I can explore more of your other works and I look forward for, to your future work. So, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, I, I think I think we can stop here today due to the time limit. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Xue Jin. Thanks, Ray. And thank you, yeah. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. think the examiner uh, is waiting for